service at Newark Baptist Temple. We're going to start our worship this evening by singing Standing on the Promises 395. Let's stand as we sing 395, Standing on the Promises.
to sing 673 Dare to Stand. And I'm going to take one phrase and put a plug in for soul winning one last time on this Sunday. This Saturday it says, lift the name of Jesus high is in the chorus. And we have a town here that needs us to lift up the name of Jesus. And the wonderful thing is, it's dare to stand, but we're not alone. And boldness doesn't come from what we can muster up, but we have a God who will enable us and give us the boldness we need to reach our community. So let's stand as we sing 673, Dare to Stand. to you. First of all, uh, the determination has been made about the funeral time uh, for Karen Lewis and uh, Teresa Adele's uh, sister, Debbie. The funeral will be uh, this coming Thursday at noon, and this is at Chris Brothers here in town, so there'll be a visitation beginning at 11, the funeral at noon on Thursday. So if you're able to go and be an encouragement to them, I think that they would appreciate that. And then also, um, Let's see, Brother Grimes mentioned, Pastor Grimes mentioned uh, Saturday Soul Winning. That's at 10 a.m. I hope you'll come and be a part of that with us this week. And Brother um, Plessinger has led our nursing home ministry in the past, and he is eager to get it going again. He's made contact with some of the nursing homes that are willing to allow people in right now for nursing home ministry. And I heard him mention this morning that the nursing homes in our area don't want just anybody coming in and doing services. They are very excited about having Newark Baptist Temple back. And uh, so if you have participated in nursing home ministry or if you would be open to letting the Lord lead you or use you in that way, then join him for a meeting immediately afterwards. Now, I would imagine this is largely an information and organizational meeting. So if you're just curious, it's okay. You can still go to the meeting, get the information that you need, uh, learn what the opportunities are. And Brother Plessinger, where are you going to meet? You're going to meet in the overflow? Overflow room on my left here immediately after the service for the nursing home ministry meeting. Now, if you're a man and I ask you to practice a song with me after the service, um, while that is important, if you are willing to participate in nursing home ministry, I want you to make that meeting the priority and we'll practice with whoever else is left. Uh, but please go and be a part of the nursing home ministry. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Sometimes we think about going to the nursing home and giving back to people who in some ways can't give back to us. Most of these people will never come through our doors. They'll never drop an offering in on our offering plate. Okay, they're never going to be able to serve us in any particular way. But I know because I cut my teeth on preaching in a nursing home that there are many blessings to be found uh, by serving those who are in the care homes. And all of us <laughs> are headed that way. <laughs> so there will be a day where we wish maybe that we had uh, been a part of that kind of ministry and we'll long for somebody to have that ministry to us. But let's invest in those right now that cannot be out and a part of our services. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we do. We'll pray for our missionaries headed to Indonesia, the Kelly family, and our ministry reformers unanimous. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of being in this place tonight. We pray that you'd open our hearts to your word and open our hearts to serving you as we've been given opportunity, even mentioned in this service. Lord, I pray especially for the Kellys as they are prepared to go to Indonesia, but needing the doors opened, 
And uh, Lord, we know that in the scripture, every time an open door was mentioned, that it had to do with the gospel. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open the door for this couple and their family to head to Indonesia soon. Lord, would you also please bless in the ministry of Reformers Unanimous International, bless in their organizational structure there in Rockford as some transition has taken place. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will put in and keep in um, those who will leave that ministry in a God-honoring way. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would meet the many needs that no doubt have arisen uh, in that ministry at this time. Thank you for our local chapter and even the first time guest that we had this last Friday night. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us to reach people with the truth that alone makes free and that truth being found in Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> One last time, go to 284 beneath the cross of Jesus, 284, let's stand as we sing, 284.
Trust in God, delight in Him, and He will give to you the treasures of His righteousness and fellowship anew. The power of the Spirit, the aroma of His fruit, the result of walking in His strength, His sweet contentment, content to be my Father's, content to be His own. Content to set the world aside and kneel before his throne. Content to follow Jesus. Content to walk by faith. Content to wield the Spirit's grace. Content in him. Content to be my father's. Content to be his own. Content to set the world aside and before his throne, content to follow Jesus, content to walk by faith, content to will the Spirit's grace, content in him, content in him. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Revelation, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, it's good to see some friends we haven't seen in quite some time tonight. Shabnam's been in our services the last couple of weeks, and I see Amir back there as well. Amir and Shabnam, welcome to both of you. We're so glad you're here in the service tonight. What a blessing to see you again. Revelation chapter 4 this evening, Revelation chapter 4. We have been looking together at the revelation of Jesus Christ, seeing Jesus in our past, our present, and in our future. We've come to chapter 4, but for those of you who have not been with us, let me kind of just briefly take you on a quick tour of where we've been in Revelation. In chapter 1, we found the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos where he was exiled. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he heard a voice behind him, and it was the voice of his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he saw a vision of Jesus walking in the midst of seven Seven, uh, golden candlesticks and holding in his right hand seven stars. These candlesticks represented seven churches that would later be referenced and the seven stars represented the messengers or the angels of those churches, perhaps the pastors of those churches. And so Jesus was seen in the midst of his churches. As we roll into chapter 2, we find that Jesus is penning seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor, beginning with the church at Ephesus and ending with the church at Laodicea. And to each of them he gave gave some messages that were somewhat unique, but one of the messages that seemed to resound with almost every church was the message of being an overcomer, being an overcomer. And that overcoming, we know from John's other writings, has to do with identifying with the overcomer, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to overcome in eternity, then you need to know Jesus personally. Then we rolled into chapter 4, and last week we put, took a little bit of a pause as we thought about verse 4, excuse me, chapter 4 and verse 1, where a door in heaven is opened, and John is caught up to see things that must be hereafter. So we talked about the subject of the rapture of the church, because we learn 
in Scripture that while Christ is coming back eventually to establish his kingdom upon the earth, there will be a time before that known as the tribulation, a time of great judgment upon the earth. And the Scriptures promise us that we as believers are not appointed unto that time of wrath, but we will hear the voice, the trump of God, and we will hear the voice of the archangel. We'll hear that come up hither and we'll rise to meet Jesus in the air and so we'll ever be with the Lord. But we were concerned last week with where on the timeline of future events does the rapture of the church occur? And we tried to demonstrate from the balance of scripture last week that it, that, 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 that event, the rapture of the church, happens prior to the tribulation. Now, that's not what begins the tribulation. It is when the Antichrist makes a covenant with the nation of Israel that will last but seven years, and he will break it, really, in the middle of the seven years. That begins the tribulation. But prior to the tribulation, we know that the church of God will be raptured out, caught out of this world, so as to escape that time of incredible tribulation. But when we roll into chapters 4 and 5, we find a throne room scene. A throne room scene. And I'm going to read all of chapter 4 here. But you'll notice in this chapter that a door in heaven opened. And John was caught up into the eternal heavens to see things that must be hereafter. As the prophetic vision transitioned from the church age, represented in chapters 2 through 3 by these letters uh, to seven churches of Asia Minor. It transitioned from the church age to the tribulation judgments that will be again being unveiled in chapter 6. John witnessed a throne room scene in heaven. And perhaps for the first time this week, the significance of that dawned upon me. That as you leave the church age and head into a time in human history unlike any time before where the Holy Spirit in the, uh, in the lives of believers on earth has been taken out because of the witness of the believers being taken out in the rapture. And there is that void left here upon the earth that gives rise to the spirit of Antichrist and ultimately that wicked one, the Antichrist, uh, with whom the tribulation judgments begin. Between those two events... God says, John, come here, I want to show you something. And yes, he would show him the set of 21 judgments that would be poured out upon the earth from which the church would be delivered. But the first thing that he shows John is a throne. And God is seated upon that throne. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look about some, at some of the things that some believers experience in the world today and the tribulation that has already begun in the lives of many today who suffer for the cause of Christ... When I look at a world in which wickedness seems to prevail in ways that are unthinkable for previous generations, I'm encouraged to remember that God is seated on his throne. When the highest human authority to whom earthlings can appeal is a dedicated servant of Satan himself, that is the Antichrist, there is still a higher throne. And the one who sits upon it is worthy of our worship. Would you look with me at chapter 4? After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. I will remind you that in chapter 1, Jesus' voice was described as having the quality of a trumpet. And the voice said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon as a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. 
And when those beasts give glory unto, and honor and thanks to him that sat upon or sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." I wonder tonight if you would join me in practicing a little bit for heaven. Would you do that? Let's read verse 11 tonight as though we are saying it to God himself, because truly we are. And let's join the 24 elders and these four angelic beasts that encircled the throne of God, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's praise him together as we read verse 11 aloud. Say it with me. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I want you to see tonight six things about this throne that is set in heaven. And each of these six things, I, I don't have an application for each one of these things today. My application for you tonight is just to be encouraged that no matter what goes on in your life and no matter what goes on in this world and no matter what this world will face in the future, that there is a throne that is set in heaven, it's placed in heaven, and there is someone who's seated upon that throne who is not only worthy of your trust, but he's also worthy of your worship. And so Roman numeral number one tonight, I want, to see, I want you to see a place for the throne. In benevolent monarchies around the world, the palace throne room was viewed much like the capital of this republic is today. Now, I'm not speaking of any kind of perfection that we would find either in our system of government or in those who govern. But generally speaking, if you are appealing for justice today, there is a ceiling to which you can appeal, appeal in this earth. And that would be if you landed in the Hall of Justice known as SCOTUS or the Supreme Court of the United States in Washington, D.C. And throughout countries today with different systems of government, they have certain offices and certain places that are the place of final appeal. In a monarchy, it was often the throne that was that place. Citizens look to these centers of power to preserve justice within the nation and to protect from threats originating outside of the nation. John's vision assures us that in heaven above there is a throne that is set above all earthly authorities. A throne that is set in heaven. Now I understand that we are to be subject to the government under which God has placed us here in the United States and I'm thankful that in our system of government by the people and for the people and of the people that we have a right to appeal. There is a process by which we appeal. But God would not have us to speak words of, of cursing or disparaging words toward those who are in authority. We're told that we should pray for them. But then we should exercise our rights as citizens and our role in a government that is of the people, by the people, and for the people. And if there is an unrighteous ruling or an unrighteous law or wrong law, we should appeal that through the proper process. One of those processes including, includes voting out those people who threaten the liberties that we hold so dearly. And uh, there's certainly a place for that as well. And, and may I say to you, regardless of what you think happened in this last election, uh, you may give up and think that, that, that there is um, perhaps um, wrong things have been accomplished in our election process. Some of you may feel that an election was corrupted this last time around. I have no doubt that there was some corruption, whether it would have changed the outcome or not. I'm not certain about this. But wherever your thinking is on that, may I tell you this, God is not incapable of giving us the leaders that we need. And uh, you can go into an election the next time and you can vote and you can vote led by biblical values, and you can do something even more powerful than vote, though. You can vote, and then you can pray that God will give us who we need. I, I hate to tell you this, but sometimes who we need is not who we vote for. Sometimes we need somebody that's not a person that we would have wanted to vote for. 
But we need that as a measure of chastisement or a measure uh, of causing us to trust in the Lord. So many times we get someone in our party or our affiliation or someone with our values in office and we lean back and we breathe a sigh of relief and we say everything's going to be okay for the next four years. If you've ever trusted in a politician, you've trusted in the wrong place. That's a misplaced trust. I believe we ought to vote for politicians, uh, leaders who, who uphold biblical values, but don't put your faith in a politician. Put your faith in the living God. When you look at throughout church history, you'll find that so many times when the church was persecuted, the church was growing and the gospel was advancing. The church historian Tertullian said this. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And even as the church was being persecuted, the gospel was advancing. Someone said it's like fanning the flames of a fire. As the church was persecuted, they were spread throughout the known world. And guess what? They took the gospel with them. And God used persecution to accomplish what he wanted to. But in spite of what we may experience today or what we anticipate experiencing in the future or what we know from the word of God others will experience in the future, we can know that there is a place where a throne has been set in heaven. And then secondly, this, this evening, I want you to see the person on the throne. The, beginning with the end of verse 2, we read, Revelation 4, into verse 2, A throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And listen to this description. And he that sat was to look upon as a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Throughout history, many have attempted to usurp the authority of God who sits on his throne. Lucifer resolved in Isaiah 14, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. But for his rebellion, we know that he was uh, to be brought down to hell, according to Isaiah 14, 15. Even today, men try to exercise their perceived right of self-determination and operate independently from God. God often overrules because he can and because he should and, and because he is Lord over all. We're not held at the mercy of politicians. We are not at the mercy of justice run amok. We are at the mercy of God. And this is no time for Christians to despair about the condition of our nation or the condition of other nations, God is still on the throne. And he's seen here in Revelation chapter 4. And then we see this multi-splendored glory of God is likened to the beauty of two precious stones surrounded by an emerald green glow described as a rainbow that appears as an emerald. The word jasper speaks of one of the stones. Jasper was the last stone in the breastplate of the high priest, representing the tribe of Benjamin, according to Exodus 28. Jasper was the first stone in the foundation and wall of the New Jerusalem that we'll read about later in Revelation 21. Jasper had many colors, but some people compare it to a diamond in that you could see through it. You have the sardine stone here. The sardine was the first stone in the breastplate of the high priest, representing the tribe of Reuben, according to Exodus 28. Sardine was the sixth stone in the foundation of the new Jerusalem of Revelation 21. And it was similar in color to a deep red ruby, Pliny, who of course was a first century Roman scientist. By the way, Pliny wrote the first encyclopedia. Millions of words he wrote. He sought, he wanted to, he set out to describe in written form everything in the natural world. And he spoke of the sardine stone. Uh, he said that it was discovered in Sardis. Remember, Jesus wrote one of his letters to the church at Sardis. He said it was discovered in Sardis, and that's the place from which it der derived its name. But when you think about jewels, no matter their color, you think about something that sparkles, that reflects light, something that is glorious, and that's the throne of God. These, this description that we find in Revelation 4 is something that we would expect would just stymie us in our steps and cause us to look with wonder and awe at the beauty that is before us. So we see a place for the throne. We see a person who is on the throne. And number three, 
I'm going to use the word presbytery, and then I'm going to defend it a little bit, okay? Because we're Baptist, and we don't use the word presbytery, but it's actually a Greek word. In fact, the word translated elder here in verse 4 is the word presbyteros. Look at verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders, that's the word presbyteros, sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, we don't practice a form of plurality of elders with rule in, as far as rule in the church goes. Uh, we would look at the office of the pastor as the office of an elder. But Presbyterianism is a system of church government that utilizes a plurality of elders. And we don't, while we don't practice that, we could call uh, these 24 elders that sit on the throne God's presbytery or presbytery. Uh, so in a Presbyterian church or in that form of government, that plurality of elders that guided the church would be called a presbytery. Now, th these elders that are spoken of here that are round about the throne, we're more concerned with not what to call the elders, but who in the world are these people? Some suggest that they're angels, which I think is the least inviting explanation. Nowhere in scripture are angels ever called elders, and nowhere are they promised crowns. Israel had elders and the church has elders. And, not, and by the way, in the New Testament, the word elder is used in two different contexts. In fact, in one chapter, in one of Paul's writing, I think in First or Second Timothy, he refers to the two in the same chapter and uses both uses of the word. So it's the same Greek word, but one place he's talking about, forgive me, old people, elders, okay? But it's very clear in the other, in the other verse, just a few verses later, he's not talking about just the elder, elderly, but he's talking about people who hold an office, of elder. So when we go to uh, rebuke someone who is older than us, then we ought to do it with respect and treat them as though they are our fathers. Instead of uh, treating them as our equals, we should look up, the, up to them in respect. And then the Bible also says regarding rebuking an elder that you need to be very careful about rebuking an elder. And in that passage, it doesn't say don't rebuke him, but you need to be careful about how you rebuke him, not with an austere or critical or an angry manner. And that's talking about, you can see it in the context there, that he's talking about the office of an elder or the office of a pastor or teacher. And so some suggest that this group was composed of the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles because the church and Israel both had elders. But John himself was one of the apostles, and John's the one who's witnessing this and writing it down. So if these thrones were for the elders, if these seats around the throne of God were for the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles, then John would have saw himself sitting on a throne. And it seems unlikely that he would have seen that and not made mention of it. I don't think that he saw himself on the thrones. And precisely who these people are may not be that important, but it is likely that the elders represent all the saints of God who are promised a joint reign with him. If you look back at verse 4, there's a few elements that make me think that this represents the saints of all ages. He said in the middle of the verse, I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. We're told elsewhere in the book of Revelation that the white raiment represents the righteousness of Christ being worn by the saints. And so we, as, as the saints of God who've trusted Christ as Savior, have acquired by uh, imputation, we have acquired the righteousness of Christ, and it's represented by white robes. So these are seen in white robes. They're very likely the saints. You also see that they have crowns. I said earlier that nowhere in the Bible are crowns promised to angels, but there are five crowns that are mentioned throughout the New Testament and promised uh, to the saints of God. Uh, they're promised to Christians. And so I believe that these 24 elders, regardless of what their specific identity is, they are there as representatives of us, who, uh, uh, for us, who will rule and reign with Christ, according to 2 Timothy 2.12 and Revelation 20 and verse 6. His saints will rule in a joint reign with the Lord Jesus. So we have the presbytery round about the throne. And then number four, I want you to notice the power out of the throne. Now, I don't know about you, if you've ever witnessed a truly spectacular display of natural power before, but there have been times where I have seen tornadoes and I've seen lightning storms that have just made me stand in awe. I stood in the basement, mind you, but they still made me stand in awe. Um, and I was the kind of person as a kid that didn't have sense enough uh, to come, out, come in out of a tornado, you know, because I wanted to see it. I would have been glad to be a tornado 
uh, chaser. When I was a child, I had my ham radio license. It, my mother said I was always a ham, but I got my license when I was 15. And uh, so I was an amateur radio operator. And my mother and I went one time to the local television station, the Fox 6, six station in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And I think the best meteorologist who's ever, ever lived, James Spann, was there. And James taught us some things about recognizing. Um, radio, when we had bad weather approaching, we would activate the weather network, and so we would report different things that we were seeing. And a lot of times, I don't know how it is now, but 20 years ago, when you get reports uh, online about, oh, there's hail at this size over here, there are uh, winds at this speed over here, there, there's no, some, nobody's out there with a meter measuring the wind. They're looking at the size of the limbs that are moving and even breaking off the trees, and they're estimating the wind speed based on those storm spotter principles. But I tell you, I've seen some awful things. And I've told you before about the tornado that hit in April of, I think, 2011 in Tuscaloosa and sucked six-inch sections of sidewalk up off of 15th Street and laid them in the middle of the road. Completely leveled the center of town. About 40 people were killed that day. There's a video on YouTube that you can go look up of the Tuscaloosa tornado that hit at that time. They measured it as an EF5 tornado. I think they later backed it down to an EF4. If that was a 4, I don't want to see a 5. It crossed right between the hospital on the campus of the University of Alabama and University Mall at the major intersection in town and someone was wise enough to sit in the parking lot of University Mall and film the whole thing. <laughs> I encourage you to turn the volume down but you can watch as that tornado passed through and if you turn the volume up at various points you can hear this guy panting and breathing very very loudly. It was, it was a very scary experience. Now, when you look at verse 5, I want you to see how uh, the, the, the power coming out of the throne of God is described. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Lightnings and thunderings and voices. How many of you have ever been very near the strike of lightning before? Yeah. It can startle you, can't, can't you? You know, it can really startle you if you're holding on to something metal at the time or if you're standing outside at the time. I remember a few years ago when I was standing in my backyard, I had been outside working and I could tell a storm was coming up. Now we have woods on the back side of our property and I could see my neighbor's house next door and they have a shed just like mine, I think a 16 by 20 shed, just like mine. I'm standing in the doorway of my shed looking through my black backyard and through their backyard and I can see their shed that is facing the same direction as me and I'm just out looking at the weather. The trees to my right are, are just whipping around, you know, and that should, by the way, that should have been a hint, okay? But they're whipping around, and, and I'm watching leaves and debris come out of the tree, and all of a sudden, as I'm, I'm trying to decide, do I go ahead and run to the house, or do I wait until this rain passes to go to the house? I'm standing in the shed, and an enormous tree that I couldn't begin to reach around in my neighbor's yard just went kaboom right over on top of their shed. I stopped waiting. I ran to the sliding glass door in the back of our house and went to open it and found that my wife had locked me out. <laughs> it happens, you know, because I'm always preaching to them, lock the door when you come in, and they did, <laughs> and they left me outside. So then I look again to the Flintstone, you remember the old Flintstone cartoon, Wilma! Okay, that's what I was doing, banging on the window, Sherry, let me in. And there was some urgency to that matter. It scared me. There was not even any lightning and thundering. But yes, I've been in places before where lightning has struck suddenly and close. And it, it, it's a, it, it'll get your attention for sure. Out of the throne of God proceed lightnings and thunderings. Imagine John in heaven looking at this very thing. Lightning and thunder, thunder emanated from the throne of God and foreshadowed the judgment that would follow. Chapters 4 and 5 immediately preceded 13 chapters of judgment. And John didn't tell his reader what the thunderous voice said until chapter 5. But notice that this thunder is associated with a voice there in verse 5. Chapter 5 records the quest to open a seven-sealed book. We'll be looking at that next week. A book of divine judgments. And so we'll hear specifically what this voice from the throne says, but we'll hear that next week. This lightning and thunder pictured the power of God to righteously judge the earth. There's a, God, there's a throne in heaven. There's a God seated upon that throne today and for eternity. We who know Christ is our Savior are promised that place with Him in joint reign in the future, represented by the elders who surround the throne. And there is power coming out of that throne to handle every problem and every injustice that you know of and even those that you don't know of. 
But number five tonight, I want you to stop for a moment and think about the perfection that we find before the throne. At the end of verse 5, we read of seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And in verse 6, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the, of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. There are two exhibits that appear before the throne of God, both speaking of His perfection. The seven lamps of fire represent the seven spirits of God. Now, these spirits were also mentioned in chapter 1 and verse 4. And you may say, wait a minute, there are seven spirits of God? Only a couple of references or three references to this that we find in the Bible. First of all, we know that God is one, but He exists, He coexists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not Father, Son, and seven spirits. But what is the reference to seven spirits here? The significance of this number may have reference to the sevenfold description of God's Spirit that we find in Isaiah 11 in verse 2. I believe I mentioned that when I preached from chapter 1. But there's a reference to seven qualities of the Spirit of God in Isaiah chapter 11 in verse 2. The number may be a simple reference to the presence of God's Spirit in seven churches because you'll remember here in Revelation that the book was first written to seven churches and so seven spirits would indicate that there's enough of God's Spirit for each of His churches. But I think that uh, the number seven likely speaks to the Spirit of God in His fullness. Seven is the number of completion or the number of perfection. And this interpretation of the seven spirits fits with the rest of this glorious throne room description. The second exhibit, well, before I speak about the second exhibit, let me make sure you get this. The Holy Spirit of God, the seven spirits of God, this number seven, always referring to completion or to perfection, the fullness of the glory of God. When John looks to the throne, he sees the fullness of the glory of God represented by these seven lamps of fire and the seven spirits of God there before the throne. So then we come to the second exhibit, and it's the sea of glass like unto crystal. Now we know that John's use of the word sea is metaphorical. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, because later in chapter 21 and verse 1, he tells us that before God in heaven there is no more, this is with the new heaven and the new earth, there is no more sea. But you can use the word sea to refer to the enormity of something. When you think about a sea, most of our earth today is covered by waters and most of that is in oceans, right? So he's talking, when he says a sea of glass, he didn't say a sea of water, he says a sea of glass and he says it's like unto crystal. This would be something with great reflecting power. His use of the word sea is probably emphasizing the enormity of this crystal reflecting surface before the throne of God. Now, reflection pools aren't used in front of slums. Right? You don't want to draw attention to something that is not perfect. But if you go, uh, Mr. Lynn will be headed down to D.C. tomorrow and um, to do some lobbying there with uh, the executive director of Buckeye Christian Schools. And I hope that he'll have time at least to run through the National Mall. That's no small feat. That's a large area. But in the National Mall, you have, of course, at the center of it all there, you have, well, not at the center, actually, you have the Capitol building, the center of D.C. You can go down in the crypt, uh, which was supposed to be the burial place for George Washington originally, but you'll find the geographic center of Washington, D.C., a little white star that's on the floor down in the crypt. And, uh, but if you were to look out in the mall area, you would see at the center the Washington Monument, the tallest uh, structure in D.C. By law, nothing is allowed to be built taller than that monument. And it's a simple monument, but it's an enormous monument. And in front of that monument is a huge rectangular body of water, the reflecting pool. Now, I, I've been there when the reflecting pool was disgusting looking. But the last time I went, it had been cleaned well, and it looked very, very nice. And especially at night, when the light was just right, if you stood up on the Lincoln Memorial and you looked out toward the Washington Monument, you could see the Washington Monument stretching into the sky, but you could also see it pointing at you in the reflection on, in that reflecting pool. And reflecting pools or reflecting surfaces are meant to add to the grandeur and the beauty of the perfection of architecture, if you will. You don't have them in slums. There is before the throne of God in heaven, in His glorious appearance as He's described here, an enormous 
uh, sea of glass like unto crystal, reflecting the glory of God. The point is that John is describing for us that there is nothing like the throne of God. There's nothing like God, there's no one like God, and there's nothing like His throne. This is a beautiful, glorious place. The sea of glass reflects the perfection of God upon His throne. He makes no mistakes. He has no flaws. He sits there in all of His perfection, which is exactly how John saw Him. Now, finally, this evening, I want you to notice the praise toward the throne. We've looked tonight at the place for the throne in heaven that is set, and it's there now and will be for eternity. We've looked at the person of God who is seated upon His throne in His glory. We've looked at the presbytery, the elders that are round about the throne representing those of us who will rule and reign with Him because of our faith in Christ. We see the power out of the throne with the lightning and the thundering reminding us that God has the power, He has the authority and the strength to judge and make right things that are wrong. We see the perfection before the throne represented in the number seven uh, um, in reference to the Spirit of God and then the sea of glass reflecting the glory of God. But number four tonight, see the praise that is offered toward the throne. Look at verse eight to begin with. Excuse me, did I say verse 8? Yes, verse, eight, uh, verse 6. Look at verse 6 and the very end of verse 6, chapter 4. There were four beasts full of eyes before and behind, and the first beast was likened to a lion, the second beast likened to a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast uh, was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is, come, is to come. These are four angelic beasts, likely seraphims. They encircled the throne of God. They had but one calling, and that was to cry, Holy, holy, holy. Now, when we see the word beast, it can be a little misleading if we're not careful. We may be helped by looking to Ezekiel's description of these same characters in Ezekiel chapter 1, because he called them living creatures. And that's what the word translated beast means. These are not ravenous beasts, all right? These are not wolves. These, these are not uh, flesh-eating animals that we're to be frightened of. These are created beings, living creatures. And they had wings. Their wings in number match Isaiah's description of seraphims in Isaiah 6. When Isaiah saw the Lord seated on His throne and His train filled the temple... Seraphim are described, described there as having six wings, two that covered their face as though to shield it from the glory of God, uh, two that covered their feet because they stood upon holy ground, and two with which they flew in service to the Lord God Almighty. All six of those wings spoke of worship. And so these seraphims or these created beings uh, that encircle the throne of God in Revelation 4 are worshiping the Lord and pointing us to worship the Lord. But they have four faces. We sometimes talk about somebody being two-faced. But four faces, that seems kind of odd to us, and we mean something entirely different, different with the term two-faced. But their four faces matched Ezekiel's description. Now, Ezekiel gave a three-dimensional description, and he said that the, each of these four faces were possessed by each individual seraphim or angel. Uh, so each of the beasts had four faces. When John describes it, it sounds like they're, that each one had a different face. I think the difference between these perspectives is obvious that, that, uh, that uh, Ezekiel gave to us a three-dimensional look and John is giving to us a single-dimensional look, but each of them can include these four faces that are described here. These faces may represent all of creation, just as the thrones and the elders upon them represent uh, believers, saints of all ages who will rule and reign with Christ. Uh, so these uh, four faces that are mentioned here, we can see a good representation of all creation. We see the lion, and he's the majestic king of wild beasts. We see the calf who is strong and uh, or grows to be strong, the king of be the beasts of burden of our service. We see the man who speaks of intelligence, the zenith of God's creation. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that every human being is terribly intelligent, but compared to the animal kingdom, every human being is pretty intelligent. 
And the man represents the, that intelligence, that zenith of God's creation, because man was created in the image of God. The eagle is swift and keen in their sight. They're the king of the air. And these four, these four faces upon these seraphims or these angelic creatures that encircle the throne of God are crying day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. Excuse me, in this passage, Holy, 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 the Lord, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, in verse 8. And then in response to what the four angelic or Living creatures cry before the throne, the 24 elders, who likely represent the saints of all ages, fell in worship and cast their crowns at the feet of the one who sat upon the throne. Look at verse 9, when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, which liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne. And, uh, um, and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. The very purpose of these four created beings was to encircle God's throne crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the, which was and is and is to come. But in response, the 24 elders who likely represent us fell in worship and cast their crowns toward the throne, saying, Thou art worthy. I told you tonight that really I don't have an application for every single point, but we often, we talk this morning about storms and sometimes there are troubles in our lives and in our world and, and it's easy for us to forget that there is a God in heaven who's seated upon the throne and He's in control of all of it. And I hope that these reminders from Revelation 4 tonight, the reminder that there is a place in heaven where a throne is set. God's always been on it. He's on it now, and He will be on it in eternity. That's the person on the throne. We have a place with Him in heaven. If we've trusted Christ as our Savior, we one day will stand in His presence like those who were seated there and the elders round about the throne. God has all the power emanating from that throne that is necessary to make wrong things right. He is doing that and He will do that at the consummation of all things. We see the perfection before the throne. God never makes an error. He has no faults. He has no deficiencies. We can trust Him entirely. But all of this should lead us to this conclusion. Just as the created beings encircled the throne, pointing us to worship. And just as the 24 elders who very well may represent us have given us the example of falling before His feet and casting of crowns at His throne, we too need to be willing, even in this age, uh, when we haven't seen with our own physical eyes the Lord sitting on His throne, we need to be willing to take by faith what the Bible tells us about God on His throne and His being totally in control now and in eternity. And we need to be able to respond by faith with worthy. You are worthy. And worship Him in sincerity and in truth. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the glimpse that we've been given tonight into the very throne room of heaven. It is so easy for us to become very myopic, very self-focused and and forget that, that you are in governance over all. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight with the eye of faith to be able to take your word at face value and to lift our voices in praise to you for who you are and where you are and what you're doing. And then, Lord, help us as these seraphims did, not only to worship you, but uh, to serve you until your Son comes for us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll stand together. The piano will play. If God is speaking to your heart tonight, maybe you've been troubled about something, injustice, problems in our world, problems in your life, would you take a moment just to say, Lord, thank you for reminding me tonight that you're on the throne and everything's all right and I just want to worship you. You are worthy. Help me to remember it.
Let me encourage you tonight, if you would be willing to have a role in a nursing home ministry and help those who cannot come out and come to church, please meet with, meet with Brother Plessinger in the overflow room here in the back. Even if you just have an interest in it and you're not sure, then go and get some information about that opportunity to serve. Let's not forget about these important people in our community. Gentlemen who are not a part of that meeting and we're going to practice music with me, we'll start that right up here at the piano in just a moment uh, with my wife and I. And I uh, hope you have a blessed week and that the Lord gives you an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Father, help us now as we leave this place to remember that we're walking into a mission field. May we be your faithful servants and point people to our Savior. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>